Coming up, uh, Trump's immunity claim had a hearing before the Supreme Court. I'll tell you how I think the court is going to come out. And I also want to critically review this atrocious um, anti-Semitism hate um, uh, speech law that just passed the um, House of Representatives and has a pretty good chance of passing uh, the Senate. Uh, Debbie's going to join me. We're going to actually talk about uh, her theory, which is that the campus protesters are a fertile breeding ground for terrorists themselves. And also, we're going to talk about the prospects of a Trump-DeSantis ticket. Is that the dream team we're looking for in 2024? Hey, if you're watching on Rumble or listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. <music> needs this voice. The times are crazy. In a time of confusion, division, and lies, we need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. I'd like to talk about two important things that happened uh, this week. The first was the Trump's case, Trump's plea for presidential immunity went before the Supreme Court. And I'd meant to talk about it earlier in the week, but I just uh, didn't. So I think it is appropriate for me to do it here on Friday as we look back on the week. But it's a very important case. Now, Trump claimed that he as president should have absolute immunity. And absolute immunity would mean just what the word says, you could do whatever you want as president and not be prosecuted for it. And Trump has said numerous times, if I don't have absolute immunity, in other words, if presidents don't have absolute immunity, they can't really uh, function. Interestingly, the uh, Biden administration, this is the Biden DOJ, made the opposite case. And by the way, Jack Smith, the special counsel who has an interest in this, the issue of presidential immunity is central to the uh, January 6th case that he's prosecuting uh, in, um, in uh, Washington, D.C. before Judge Tanya Chutkin. He was there. He was listening. And he heard his own side make the case that, that there should be no immunity. In other words, that presidents should not be immune from any criminal behavior whatsoever. They can be charged with a crime. And if they're guilty, if they're found guilty, they did the crime, then too bad. It doesn't matter if you're the president. No one is above the law. And the Supreme Court, it turns out, was in the main uh, taking a middle position. And all the justices seem to be in the middle of these two extremes. Now, the three liberals on the court were more leaning toward the Biden DOJ side and the six conservatives uh, or the five conservatives and one moderate, however you want to call it, were leaning more toward the Trump side. But this distinction, I think, became critical uh, for the hearing, and that is uh, the Supreme Court drew a, a sharp line between um, presidential conduct that is part of your duties in office and private conduct that you do that is not part of your duties in office. So this distinction, I think, in most cases is extremely clear. If the president, for example, undertakes to do something and it is part of his job description. It includes things that presidents do, pass legislation, uh, have a bully pulpit to speak to the country, uh, engage with uh, issues that the country is dealing with, uh, try to make sure that the pr procedures and processes of the executive branch are properly in place. This is all the president's job. And the Supreme Court seemed to have a clear majority on the side that there should be immunity for that. You don't want there to be vengeful prosecution of presidents after they leave office. Oh, you did this over here. You did this over there. You did this in the Middle East. We're going to charge you with a crime. The president can't really function if he's paralyzed by the uh, doubt or the fear that he's going to be held criminally liable for decisions he makes in the conduct of his presidential office. So I think that the Supreme Court is quite clearly going to come out and say 
presidents have immunity for official conduct. But, and there is a big and important but, and that is that we now need to contrast official conduct with private conduct. So private conduct in its extreme form would mean something like the president leaves the White House, he goes out for a drive, he then goes up to a house in Washington, D.C., somebody opens up the door and the president shoots that guy. Uh, or the president uh, um, commits some private offense against somebody and is charged with a crime. Or let's say, for example, the president decides to ride a bike and he crashes into somebody, severely injuring them. The point here being that we do things in our private life that are not really part of our official duties. And, and why should the president get immunity for those things that are, in a sense, conduct done as a private individual? So I think this is actually the court being very smart here, not actually taking one side or the other completely, but recognizing that there is a kind of substantive difference between an official act and a private act. Now, in fairness, that line is not always so clear. I think it's pretty clear that presidents do have a duty to make sure elections are properly conducted. I don't think that a president, for example, contesting an election, uh, I certainly don't think a president having a rally in Washington, D.C. and calling for people to peacefully and patriotically march on the Capitol, none of that would seem to, to be, all of that would seem to fall within Trump's official duties. That's something that presidents do, including, by the way, running for re-election. Most presidents who are elected do run for re-election. So that falls into the official category. But let's take something like this. Trump has a conversation with Rudy Giuliani, who is, by the way, not a part of the government. Giuliani is a private citizen at that time. Uh, and they discuss, for example, go over to uh, uh, Georgia and do this, or I want you to say that. Uh, now, I'm not talking about anything specific that Trump and Giuliani talked about. I'm just giving this as a sort of hypothetical. And let's say that somehow in there, there is some alleged criminal conduct. Well, the idea would be here that this is actually not part of Trump's official duties. He's, in fact, not interacting with people in the executive branch at all. He's interacting with a private citizen over a matter that is not of, of consequence to the people of the country as a whole, not of consequence to the government, but something that is in Trump's own interest. This could qualify as a private transaction, not, if you will, a public one. And so I think what the Supreme Court is going to do, and it's going to be very bad news for Jack Smith and actually good news for Trump, is the Supreme Court is going to come out probably next month and say, hey, listen, we're going to remand this case back to Judge Tanya Chutkin. We're going to tell her to undergo a process of separating out what actions that Trump did that qualify as part of his official business all of those are immune from criminal prosecution, so take them off the table. Um, I think, quite honestly, this will gut a good bit of Jack Smith's case. And as Debbie reminded me, there's also the 1512, the kind of uh, obstruction of an official proceeding that is separately before the Supreme Court. So if the Supreme Court knocks that out, it's hard to see what's kind of left of Jack Smith's case. In theory, he could still proceed, but there's also going to be a long delay, probably a delay that takes the whole matter beyond the 2024 election. I want to talk about a second matter that I alluded to yesterday. Well, I started talking about it yesterday. It is this bill that is passed by the House, voted, a lot of Democrats voted for it, a lot of Republicans voted for it. It's supposed to be, it's well-meaning. It's supposed to, like, let's outlaw hate speech related to Israel and anti-Semitism. But look at the, look at the stuff that they supposedly want to, that they, not supposedly, that's in the bill, that they want to outlaw as hate speech. Quote, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g., example, by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Now, the state of Israel is not a racist endeavor, but saying so is not hate speech. Number two, applying double standards by requiring of it a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. It's, in other words, if you single out Israel and say Israel must pay attention to civilian casualties, but you don't ask any other country to do that. Well, that is a double standard, and I think morally it's unconvincing, but it's not hate speech. Number three, using the symbols and images associated with classic anti-Semitism, e.g. claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis. If you say the Jews killed Jesus, I think that's a kind of a... 
well, I mean, strictly speaking, it's accurate, uh, but in the, in the way that it's used to blame Jews who are around today as if you killed Jesus, it's obviously a, an anachronism, a fallacy. But again, is it hate speech? Is it speech that you want to sort of criminalize? Is it speech that you want to disallow? Absolutely not. And finally, drawing comparisons of con contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Look, it's very distasteful to do that. Quite frankly, when people make Nazi comparisons, you always have to ask, are these comparisons even valid? Because very often someone does, say, that's just what Hitler did. So this reductio ad Hitlerum is indeed overused in the discourse, but not only with regard to Israel. It's overused in American discourse all the time. So my point about it is, why is the U.S. Congress, who are the stupid Republicans that somehow think it's a good thing? We're trying to fight against cancellation. We're trying to fight for free speech. Now, again, we're not trying to fight to allow any kind of speech at all. If you ask me, is there conceivable hate speech? Yeah. If you actually call for all the Jews at Columbia to be murdered, uh, if you call for genocide against the Jews on your campus, that comes perilously close to hate speech. I'm not exactly interested in fighting to protect that kind of speech, particularly in a certain context where there's imminent risk of harm and so on. That speech is and should be illegal. But on the other hand, having opinions, whether right or wrong, whether exaggerated or not, whether you're pro-Israel or anti-Israel, I am, I am strongly against these protesters and activists on campus. We've even called them, you know, Hamas encampments and so on. But the idea that their speech should be outlawed is no less abhorrent than the idea that my speech should be outlawed. So I hope that this atrocious bill, uh, which has passed the House now, I think there's a decent chance it'll pass the Senate. I hope it doesn't become law, but I fear, alas, that it might. Are you ready to lose weight but not sure where to start? Well, I understand. Debbie and I were right where you are a year ago. Let me tell you why we chose PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition and why I so highly recommend their program. First, Dr. Ashley Lucas has her PhD in Chronic Disease and Sports Nutrition. Her program is based on years of research. It's science-based. It works. Second, the PhD program starts with nutrition, but it's so much more. They know that 90% of permanent change comes from the mind, and they work on eliminating the reason you gain this weight in the first place. There are no shortcuts, no pills, no injections, just solid science-based nutrition and behavior change. And finally, perhaps most important, the result. I lost 27 pounds, Debbie lost 24. We haven't gained the weight back. The best thing about this program is they have an 85% success rate of their clients maintaining their weight loss for life. They provide elevated maintenance support for you through the PhD alumni community, which will provide you the support you need to keep this weight loss off forever. So if you're ready to lose weight for the last time, call 864-644-1900 to get started. You can also go online at myphdweightloss.com. The number again to call 864-644-1900. Remember as a kid how your parents and grandparents made you eat all the vegetables on your plate? Well, I do. Oh, when they coaxed you to eat fruit instead of sweets? Uh-huh. That's because they knew what was good for you. And it's truer today than ever before. You need to eat your fruits and veggies. We all do. There's no substitute for a healthy diet, but there is this balance of nature. Fruits and veggies in a capsule, so easy to take. The products are gluten-free, they're non-GMO, they contain no added sugars or synthetics. So if you're looking for something to make you feel better naturally, you should definitely try Balance of Nature today. Eat your fruits and veggies every single day with Balance of Nature. I started taking Balance of Nature the day I decided I was ready to feel better. So are you ready to feel better? Whether you order online or call direct, you gotta use promo code AMERICA to get the special offer, 35% off. Call them, 800-246-8751, the number again, 800-246-8751, or go to balanceofnature.com. When you use discount code AMERICA, you'll get their special offer, 35% off. I'm uh, really glad to have Debbie back for our Friday roundup these days. Um, well, she's not always in town because... Um, You've still been making trips back and forth to uh, the Rio Grande Valley to visit your mom. Mm -hmm. And um, she's hanging in there. Yeah, she's been in hospice since uh, mid-March. And here we are, beginning of May. And she uh, she seems to be getting better, um, thankfully. But, um, but it is really sad to see her just lying in bed and she's not able to, to walk and... 
um, it's it's difficult for her to swallow and all those I mean, she things. She sometimes goes a day or even days without, without any nutrition, yeah, without proper really nutrition. Eating. So it's a it's a kind of an odd, almost a limbo, I guess. Yeah. When, with, with, with uncertainty about what what direction it's going. Is she going to get better? Mm -hmm. Maybe even get out of hospice. Some people mm -hmm. do. Or, or not. Mm -hmm. Yep. So in the meantime, I just go as often as I can. And it's difficult because obviously, I still produce the show, I take it with me on the road. Take and your computer. Yeah, and I'd, so anyway, but it's good to be here. So. Yeah. And I notice you're wearing your, um, your star. My star of David necklace. Yeah. 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 Uh, obviously, you know, we're going to talk about about Israel and, and about what's going on. Um, and as you know, I get notifications from from the IDF through I Israel real time on WhatsApp. Um, and uh, they have a disastrous, in my opinion, deal um, that is in the works um, basically, for for forty days, they're going to do this uh, throughout forty days. The Israeli forces are going to withdraw from the densely populated areas, and um, they will uh, aircraft traffic in Gaza Strip will be suspended for eight to ten hours every day. Uh, the, of course, the displaced Gazans will be able to return to their homes. Um, and then it goes on to say that during this period, Hamas will release at least thirty three hostages. Under the category women, children up to the age of 19, adults over the age of 50, sick and wounded. But Israel is going to release 20 Arab prisoners for each hostage. What? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really disastrous because, number one, if the, whole, if the whole point of this war is to decimate Hamas, this isn't going to decimate Hamas. No, and not to mention the fact that if I were Hamas, I would say, all right, well, this is a, a wonderful... Um, reason for me to take more hostages because guess what every time I get one first of all I can do whatever I want with them and then they become an incredibly valuable form of currency I can buy 20 Arab captives for each one especially if they're women and children right right so it it is I mean, does no one think about this kind of thing when they make you these know deals? what and i asked a friend our friend zev and he says i said why on earth would would israel agree to do this he said u.s pressure so in other words the biden administration the biden administration is pressuring israel to do this as you know they're no friend they're really you know i think it's it, i think it's pretty safe to say that the democrats are no friend of israel they're not i mean ironically israel has one friend in the world and that's the united states but the united states is is controlled <laughs> the united by states is exactly it's occupied by its own regime right uh, the right. biden regime and they are most definitely not so even though they said some of the right things after october 7th you're saying that their actual pressure is on Israel and Israel doesn't want to lose the United States well, also. The problem is is the Biden administration is saying, yes, but these Gazans, you know, look what ha what is happening to the Gazan population, but they don't address the fact that Hamas intertwines themselves with the Gazans and makes them human shields. They never talk about that. They no. never talk about that. And that is the problem. That's the crux of the matter. Now, what do you make? Uh, I think you take a much darker view than I do of these protests on the campus oh, here in America, certainly. not just on the campus, but also in the street. Apparently, the protesters are a 50-50 mix, at least on many campuses, of students and outside agitators. I mean, that itself is interesting because the outside agitators are organized. They're possibly paid. They bring in equipment like tents and things like that, that that are all similar on different campuses around the country. So there's clearly a whole supply chain that's providing all this. And you think that this could be, I mean, a little ISIS in America. It's jihad. It's jihad. It's it's I I believe that these are little terrorists in the making. And and why I say that is I was looking at some of the kids that were arrested, uh, some of the adults, too. But some of the kids that were arrested in UCLA, because th uh, this morning they were actually showing them being arrested. They, they wore masks, not for covid, but just to disguise themselves. And right. they were being the masks were being taken off by the by the cops. And a lot of them did look Middle Eastern. They looked, they looked 
like they could be from the Middle East, but uh, and some of them just look like normal hippies. But see, what what I find really funny is a lot of these are going to be terrorist recruits. Okay, I, I know that because the fact that that they don't even that they don't care that they are actually in favor of of Hamas by default. If not, you know. I mean, you can tell they have no love for, the, not just for Israel, they have no love for America. They have no love they have for no America. They have no love for the universities that are giving them scholarships absolutely, in many cases. Absolutely, absolutely not. They, they hate these places. They do, they do. And anyways, but I was, what I was going to say is that these kids, the Middle Eastern kids, are prime for uh, for radicalization, okay? They're, they're probably going to be radicalized in some way. But the white hippies that are taking part are so dumb <laughs> They don't realize they're being played. And and I'm talking about the Bill Ayers of the world. I'm talking about even the, you know, the adult Soros. I, I sent Soros. you a little thing where Bill Ayers is yeah, now. Sure. Yeah. I think for Bill Ayers, it's Vietnam all over Yeah, again. I think so. And I think that they really think this is a worthy cause. But what they don't realize is that at the end of the day, their head is going to go on a platter because these Islamists are going to do that. They do not like them. The left thinks, you know what? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So I'm going to be friends with these Islamists. Well, guess what? They're going to have your head. They would have no hesitation <laughs> about have... putting poor Bill Ayers, even no. you know, seventy-eight year old though he no. is, chopping Ab- his head off. Absolutely not. They're these are jihadists. These these are these are. Muslim radicals that will stop it. And look, as you know, I've watched, I think, all of the videos that are out there of the massacre of October 7th. And and so I know what these people are capable of yeah, doing. Yeah, I mean, I got to say, this is why Debbie is on the warpath on this oh. issue. And it's, and I've seen some of this. You've yeah, shown some I, of it to me, but only a, only a I portion. Have only you showed get almost a daily diet oh. of these videos. And I think it the level of barbarism is shocking. It, it, I was, I, look, I couldn't sleep for days weeks after seeing these these videos uh, i was just i i couldn't i couldn't understand how any human being could do this to another human being and especially to babies to children little girls women old women elderly women uh, i i couldn't and, and, and take such relish in it. And take relish in it and brag about it. Yeah. You, uh, this is the part, I mean, I mentioned in my monologue that, you know, the, the kind of reductio ad Hitlerum or the Nazi analogy, but even the Nazis did not. You, you, you won't find Nazis dancing around a death camp. Um, so the Nazis tried to hide the death camp. It was more secretive. It was secretive. It was more secretive. These was, guys are over, like proud of the handiwork. Yeah, they they're are. They're making videos of it. They do. And and I just saw another video yesterday of a of a man killed uh, in his home. And, and the terrorist was laughing as he was shooting his head off. Yeah. Literally, expl- yeah. his head exploded. I mean, Israel has every moral justification. Look, there are some people who have reasonable arguments about the level of U.S. aid to Israel. Is it to what degree is it our problem? And and you can have those debates. I think there's nothing wrong with those. But the fact that Israel has the the moral authority oh. to respond to October seventh, I think it's the same level of moral authority we had after nine eleven. Yeah, but I think it, it, you know, I, I obviously I was horrified with nine eleven, uh, but but these people took relish in in like killing each individual person, not even raping just flying the a women, plane into a building. raping women with such violence that they broke their hips, their bones, their pelvic bones were shattered from the rapes. I mean it. It just, it's a level of barbarism that, that only the jihadists actually seem to have. And yeah. and so, you know, for those reasons, I, I don't understand how the Biden administration can even make a moral equivalent with, with what Israel is, how re- Israel is responding to these people. Because as you know, I said, no, do the same thing to them. Do the same thing to their moms and their daughters that and their babies. That would be babies. moral equivalence. That would be moral equivalent. And that's not what Israel is doing. Yeah, exactly. You might have heard Michael Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of the box stores or the shopping channels the way they used to. 
they've been part of this cancel culture. Well, let's uncancel them. And the way to do that is to take advantage of a savings extravaganza, a $25 deal that they're offering. Now, when Mike started my pillow, it was just a one product company, just the pillow. But with the help of his dedicated employees, Mike now has hundreds of products and some of them you probably don't even know about. So to get the word out, I want to invite my viewers and listeners to check out the $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use my pillows, 25 bucks. My pillow sandals, $25. Six pack towel sets, $25. $25. Brand new four pack dish towels, you guessed it, $25. And for the first time ever, the premium my pillows with the all new Giza fabric, just $25. By the way, orders over $75 get free shipping as well. This amazing offer won't last long. Take advantage of it. Go to mypillow.com or you can call 800 876 0227. The number again, 800 876 0227. To get the discounts, to get the free shipping, you need to use the promo code. It's D I N E S H Dinesh. Guys, if you'd like to support my work, there's an easy way to do it. Check out my Locals channel. You can become a monthly or an annual subscriber. I post a lot of exclusive content there, including content that is censored on other social media platforms. On Locals, you get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You can also interact with me directly. I do a live weekly Q&A every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic is off limits. I've also uploaded some cool films to Locals. I've got Dinesh's movie page up there, 2000 Mules is up there, as well as the latest film, Police State. Uh, if you're an annual subscriber, you can stream and watch this movie content for free. It's included with your subscription. So check out my channel. It's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's Dinesh.Locals.com. We want to talk in our second segment about Trump. And so get this. Trump goes to, um, goes to court and he is in attendance for the trial. The moment that the trial adjourns. Trump is out and on a plane, and he goes to Wisconsin and Michigan, both attends major rallies in both states, and flies back to New York so he can be back in court 9 a.m. the next morning. Oh, I mean, just my think about this. First of all, God. could Biden do this? No way. I couldn't do that. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't think either, I don't think either of us could. In fact, you, we would. You might. I probably not could me. in my old days. I don't know if I could today. Yeah, you get tired easily now. Well, I mean, Trump is more. Trump is considerably I, older than I am. I and this don't, man has um, prodigious energy. How? Uh, and yeah. and not to mention the fact that, of course, he and I were texting in the middle of it. <laughs> You're know. like, how are you communicating with Trump? And I'm like, well, that's because he's at a rally. Yeah. And he must, he, you know, he has a little bit of ADD. So I think when he has a break <laughs> in the rally, he looks at his text. Oh, there's something from Dinesh. Okay, here we go. Yeah. And of course, you were laughing at the fact that his text was in all caps. Yeah, it was great. Uh, only one part of it. was, all, part And of we it. can't talk about it yet, but it, hopefully. Well, it relates to things that yeah, we're working yeah. on. And, yeah. and very nicely, Trump, uh, you know, commended Brandon, my son-in-law, son-in-law for yeah. his success. And Trump very notably goes, he's a winner. And yeah. Trump loves, you know, he, he loves, loves winners. success. He, he loves, loves winners. winners. So, um, yeah. so and, it was great and stuff. Speaking, and speaking of winners, do you think that this Trump DeSantis situation might be a winning ticket for the Republican oh. Party? Well, the latest round was that, as you know, there was a lot of bad blood when uh, DeSantis was in the race uh, coming from both sides as oh, far yes. as I could see. <laughs> now, not all of it was coming from Trump uh, or DeSantis. There was some, but a lot of it was coming from the Trump stirs and the DeSantis camp, the kind of DeSantis influencers, so to speak. And uh, it was kind of bitter and some of them are still bitter about it. But, but Trump and DeSantis, initially when they did a treaty, I thought it was maybe just in one of those... Um, hands, you know, arms length types of, but they had a recent meeting and Trump put out a very cordial statement, essentially saying DeSantis is completely on board. Yeah. And that revived in my mind the question of, because I was in favor of a Trump DeSantis alliance from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, much as in, maybe I'm in favor of it, but maybe the two parties are just temperamentally incapable of it. it. Trump just can't bring himself to do that. He thinks DeSantis is such a sellout because DeSantis kind of cut his teeth on MAGA and now he's turned out to turn against Trump. I think DeSantis thought that Trump has made this too personal. They should be able to run. What? Why shouldn't he be able to? So I thought this, these guys are never going to get together. But it, politics does make strange bedfellows, mm -hmm, and I do mm -hmm. think it is a real possibility. And I do think that at least from in a certain obvious sense, it will unify the Republican Party 
virtually everybody who is anti-Trump has something good to say about DeSantis. Mm -hmm. Now, not the sort of some of the never Trump people are secret Democrats. They're they want Biden to win. Of course. And so they don't like Trump. They don't like DeSantis either. Yeah. Um, they might be OK with a Chris Christie or a Nikki Haley, but they mm -hmm. also recognize that 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 that's never going to happen. It's mm -hmm. not even remote. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think a Trump DeSantis ticket is a real possibility. And I think Trump should not write it out. Yeah. Should, he yeah. should consider it. Well, you know, I heard the other day on the radio that two um, that Two people can, uh, you know, president and vice president cannot be from the same state. What is up with that? Is yeah, that so we something talked about that, that and, and, and I did a little bit of research on yeah. it because, as it turns out, uh, that is not really true. Okay. So let me let me explain. And I'm I'm actually drawing here on a legal scholar who is talking about it, but he's giving them the mainstream view. Quote: There is nothing in the U.S. Constitution that prevents candidates for president and vice president who live in the same state from running together. Now. He admits, as a practical matter, it may be a bad idea because very often the president has locked up his own state, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, with Reagan, it was like, let me pick a candidate who rep from a different part of the country. Maybe they'll bring me a valuable state like Ohio. Right. So those considerations, but those are practical considerations. Mm -hmm. The question we're exploring, is there something in the Constitution that prohibits you? Well, let's look at the phrase. This I'm not reading the Constitution. This is Article 2, Paragraph 3. Quote, the electors dot 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 there's some irrelevant verbiage there the electors shall vote for two persons of whom at least of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves so think about it the the language is not saying that the two guys on the tickets cannot be from the same state it is saying that the elector cannot vote for a slate in which both the candidates are in their home state. So for example, if I'm in a home state of, let's say, Florida, and I'm voting for Trump and DeSantis both, they are both in my state. So I, as an elector, cannot vote for both of them because they happen to be in the same state as me. So here, here's the point. It used to be apparently in American politics that the president and the vice president were on separate tickets. They ran separately. And so essentially oh. the Constitution was trying to spread things around uh -huh. and say, listen, you don't want a president and a vice president and the elector casting his vote all to be from the same state. It'll concentrate power too much in like one pocket of the country. Mm -hmm. So the elector can't vote for a president and a vice president who are from the same state as he is. That's the restriction. But the important thing here is that Trump and DeSantis can most certainly run together. In fact, very interestingly, you remember when George W. Bush ran, Dick Cheney was evidently at that time a resident of Texas. And so, of course, was George W. Bush. Okay. Now, what happened is right before the election, like five days before, Dick Cheney, because he, he saw, OK, Texas and Texas, he went and changed his registration to Wyoming. Now, of course, he had a ranch in Wyoming, so he had a good reason to do that. And he essentially made the issue moot by doing that. In fact, somebody went to court and said, Dick Cheney cannot uh -huh. be the vice president because he's from the, the court. It was like, we're not nonsense. even going to pay any attention to this nonsense. So mm -hmm. I think it's not really going to matter. But as a oh. tokenistic matter, Trump and DeSantis at the last minute trump could change his residence to new york for like one day uh, the election is over they're not from the same state i, oh, I don't think this is going to be an you issue you know the left will make it an issue like there's no because tomorrow. it's trump oh my gosh i mean listen the yeah. left well, look what they're doing they're essentially trying to get him off the ticket altogether no but they realize that they can do these shenanigans to try to prevent him from being elected if he is elected the chance that they can then stop him see the simple truth of it is is once you get across the finish line, yeah. it's really difficult to change the outcome for anyone. The difficulty in 2020 was that they weren't able to bust all the cheating beforehand. So Biden gets across the finish line and then Trump is trying to undo the outcome. Mm -hmm. Very hard to do. Mm -hmm. It'll be very hard for the left to do it if it goes, I, if I it goes the so. other way. I hope so. It's, but it's, it's interesting, though, because like I told you the other day, I said, you know, this is going to be every every time we have an election, the the losing party is going to say that the winning party cheated and back and forth and back it's and forth. Gonna become a habit. It's going to become like kind of like saying someone's a racist. It has no meaning anymore because everyone is now a racist. And so it's going to be every election is, is going to be fraudulent. But 
of course, we know that this one actually was. The 2021 um, the 2020 definitely 2020 was. And I, I think they're going to try. They're, tr they're You know, look, if you, what are these cases if not election interference? So this right. may be their 2000 mules, except they're doing it out in the open now. Mm -hmm, they you are. Know, the mules thing will, probably won't work again. You raised an interesting question yesterday. I think we were just chatting about what will happen if this election proceeds and Trump is in fact in jail? Yeah, yeah. And I was saying that is such a wild card. Yeah. It could actually increase public support for Trump. It could, it could be so shocking to the sensibilities, not just of Republicans, but independents, even some Democrats. Like, what? You have an election underway and they're jailing? I mean, that is classic yeah. kind of authoritarian oh, I told third you, world it's, behavior. It's extreme third world country behavior. I yeah. mean, that, if you can't win an election, uh, if you can't cheat enough, in other words, if, if the person will win with, you know, by a landslide and you cannot ch have enough votes to cheat with, with, then what better way than to just get him out of the way? Just lock him up. Just lock I him mean, up. I mean, for decades, in fairness, you know, you have Freedom House, you've got all these agencies of the U.S. government, the State Department. If any other country locks up its opposition leader in the weeks and months leading up to the election, we scream... You're not a democracy. Yeah. You're not a true democracy. This is not a real election. It's a fake election. Even in Venezuela, mm -hmm. when Hugo Chavez first ran, he didn't lock up the member of the opposition party. They ran in an election. And as you said, in the first election. At the beginning, but then he did beginning. start doing but it. But later he started he doing did. right. And, and now Maduro has, has tried to get uh, Maria Corina out of the way. That's right. Right. He She's has, the legitimate yeah. nominee of the opposition. Yeah. Maduro is trying to get her to prevent her from running uh, on the grounds of the fact that she had been barred previously from running. Right. So the parallels with Venezuela. Oh, yeah. They continue. keep going. They, they keep, keep continuing. Going. <laughs> I'm talking about the four cultures or the four folkways that shaped the United States at the beginning before the American Revolution. And we're going to zoom into the first of the four, which is the Puritans, the people who set up, inaugurated the culture of New England, the culture that is today so left-wing, so democratic, so woke. Its origins were from a group of people who were deeply religious, uh, determined to create, it was their phrase, uh, John Winthrop, a city on a hill. But a city on a hill in which you didn't have the freedom to do whatever you want. You basically had the freedom to be a member of that community and follow its strict rules. Now, interestingly, this Puritan migration occurred over really just a 10-year period. Unbelievable. All of New England was settled really in 10 years. Now, obviously, the people who settled it had uh, a lot of children and grandchildren, and so their numbers expanded greatly. But... What happened in England uh, is what caused this migration. Uh, Charles I was the ruler of England, uh, an Anglican king, but he was sometimes suspected of having sort of Catholic sympathies. Um, and he decided to rule autocratically, to rule without a parliament. Why? Because he was fighting with parliament. Ultimately, by the way, this would go into a civil war and Charles I would lose his head over it. Uh, and then parliament would take over. And amazingly enough, that would produce a second wave of migration to America. So what we're beginning to see is the first wave came from the people who were persecuted by the king. And then when parliament took over, the second wave, these are the people who went to Virginia, were the people on the king's side who are now on the losing side in England. And so they began to flee to America, creating a different culture in the American South. Now, uh, Charles I had a powerful Archbishop of Canterbury, a guy named William Laud, and this guy decided to crack down on the Puritans and purge the church, the English church, of its Puritan members. This was also, by the way, a time of economic depression, of epidemic disease, and uh, as John Winthrop himself basically put it, he says, essentially, this is about as vile an environment as we can possibly endure. And so you can see the temptation for the Puritans to flee. Some of them went to Ireland. A bunch of them went to Netherlands and the Rhineland. Some of them, about 20,000, went to the West Indies. Uh, they went to places like Barbados and uh, Nevis and St. Kitts. 
But a fourth contingent decided to go to Massachusetts, and they contributed an enormous amount to the culture of North America. They were also the very first of the settlers. And they came, as I say, in a decade, between 1629 and 1640. In 1640, the English Civil War broke out. And amazingly, some of the Puritans who were in America decided to go back to fight on the Puritan side, on the Cromwell side of the Civil War against uh, the king, against Charles I. And uh, so the migration flow ended as rapidly as it began. It began abruptly. There was a wave of people who came over a decade, and then it stopped, and some of those people actually went back. Now, to get an idea of numbers, the... Um, the original uh, migration was uh, about 80,000. About 80,000 people came. So a pretty decent sized number, but not a gigantic number. But pretty soon, by 1700, it was over 100,000. By 1800, it was over 1 million. By 1900, 6 million. And by the end of the century, something like 16 to 18 million. So these are people who came to America now, they landed, most of them, they landed in Massachusetts, but they began to occupy a lot of southern New England, eastern New Jersey, and northern New York. Uh, it says, uh, in the 19th century, their descendants migrated east to Maine and Nova Scotia, some went north to Canada, and along the way they founded cities like Buffalo, Cleveland, Chicago, St. Paul, Denver, Seattle, San Francisco, and Salt Lake City. So you can see that this East Coast migration also became a migration across the country. Uh, it reached Chicago, it then went further west uh, to uh, Salt Lake City, and ultimately uh, northwest to, to San Francisco. Today, if you go to San Francisco, you'll notice it looks a lot like Boston. It is the most European city uh, in the West Coast, and many people think the most European city in America, but I find it to be quite similar architecturally, even culturally, to Boston. Why? Because it's the same type of people who orig originally settled it. Now, what was the purpose for which the Puritans came? Uh, the historian David Hackett Fisher tells us that religion was not their main purpose, it was their only purpose. Their goal was to create a biblical commonwealth here in the northeastern United States. And everything that they did was shaped by that. Now, today there's a school of history. It's, these are the so-called materialists, and they tend to try to look at history in terms of the material conditions, the scarcities, the abundance, the things like that, the economic conditions. But but even though no one is free of economics, in other words, the Puritans, like everybody else, had to figure out a way to survive, that wasn't really their motivation. That wasn't, they weren't driven by economic factors, they were driven by religious factors. And the proof of it is when they got to America, the first thing that they did, and it wasn't very, wasn't very easy to do, is they all joined churches. They all joined essentially Puritan churches, churches by which, by the way, you had severe qualifications to join, not only a profession of commitment. I mean, these days you want to join a church, you just show up, they're happy to have you. But in Puritan days, you had to not only make an extensive commitment, you had to agree to follow all the rules, and more important, you had to show blameless moral character before they would take you in the first place. And yet, a majority of adults could meet these conditions and they joined these churches. And, um, and the, um, the inspiration for the churches was uh, the Bible, it was the Old Testament, but most of all, if there was one man who shaped the Puritans, it was none other than John Calvin. And the underlying philosophy of the Puritans, and again, whenever I talk about the Puritans, I want you to kind of keep in mind the woke left in America today, because you're beginning to, you're going to see in a strange way, uh, echoes of the Puritans in the woke left today. First of all, they had the idea of natural depravity. In other words, that people are basically evil. Now, today, the left doesn't think that people are evil. But what does the left think? Institutions are evil. There's structural oppression and racism. So the idea of evil being inherent, built in, the difference is that the Puritans thought it was built into you. 
Whereas the, the left today in New England thinks it is built into the structures of society. But I mean, who made those structures? We did. Human beings did. So if human beings don't have a natural depravity, how would the structures automatically assume this kind of depravity? Obviously, the structures are a reflection of the people who built them. So the Puritans believe that um, that you've got this natural depravity and that shapes the way your society needs to be organized. Number one, you've got to treat children not as innocent, but as naturally depraved individuals that need to be controlled and told what to do. Uh, the job of schools and colleges is to instruct them, uh, to cajole them, to use persuasion if necessary, but force if you have to. Um, the second idea that comes out of natural depravity is that the emphasis on virtue in a society. And for the Puritans, that just meant rules. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't say this, you can't say that. So the Puritans, for example, would have considered something like the First Amendment to be absolutely ridiculous. Um, and, and, and this is important for us to know because sometimes when we talk about America being founded, we talk about the Puritans. And at other times, we talk about the American founders as if this was the same group of people. No. The American founders, by the way, first of all, they came much later. The Puritan migration, as I mentioned, uh, ended in 1640. The American Declaration of Independence is 1776, so that's well over a century after that. But the American founders had a very different sensibility than the Puritans. For the Puritans, the important ideas were natural depravity. The second important idea was the covenant, the covenant between not only God and man, but between also man and man through God. So, for example, marriage is seen as a covenant that a man and a woman make with each other, but they make it with God's supervision and God's um, uh, sovereignty over it. And so uh, the Puritans looked at society as a web of contracts. And the final idea I want to stress, and again, let's think about the woke left today, um, is the idea of the elect. We don't use the word elect today, but we use a very similar word in describing the left, the elite. So the elect are the ones who are chosen by God for salvation. And for the Puritans, it was a really important question. Am I saved or am I not? And more equally important, not just am I saved, how do I know I'm saved? In other words, how do I know I'm a member of the elect? Let's remember the Puritans believed in predestination, that God already chose his elect at the beginning of the world. But how do you know if he chose you? So for the Puritans, it was an obsession to f look for signs that they were part of the elect. Well, today, the descendants of those same Puritans also consider themselves in a way superior, but not superior because God chose them. They're superior because they're better educated. They're superior because they've got the right views. They're superior because they have the sort of inner track in society. They are at the best schools. So they consider themselves to be better people, and therefore they think they have the right, as the Puritans thought they had the right, to tell other people how to live, what to think, what to eat, how to behave, and what to do. So there are very interesting parallels between the ancient Puritans who came 400 years ago to this country and their descendants who are in the same part of the country now with a politics that is perhaps very different from the Puritans, but reflects some of the same noticeable and inherent tendencies. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.